This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by Slice on Broadway. Supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza, sliceonbroadway.com. And listeners like you, support this show at patreon.com slash awesomecast. Sidekick Media Services. We are your sidekick in business for social media, video production, and more. Find out more at sidekickmediaservices.com. It's time to get geeky, get techy. It is the awesome cast. I'm Mike Sorgat, Sorgatron on the Twitter, video producer, podcaster here in the Pittsburgh area from the Sorgatron Media Studios in the Beachview neighborhood, right on the tracks here, ready to get techy with all of you and all of you out in the chat room here live on the Facebook Live uh, as well. Uh, thank you, everybody that's jumping in there and uh, checking it out. But we got a hell of a crew. Everybody's remote. Nobody's in the studio. More pizza for me. First of all, we do have out there from the Big D, Dormont, from Studio C, it is John Chichilla. He's the gadget guru over at Big Bank International Esquire. How's it going today? It, there's there's people in the studio. You and Missy are there. But yes, we are. He, I, yeah, I, but I'm just saying it's just us. We're always here, though, Chilla. It's, you're you're on that you're on the ones and twos. My name just got really big really quick. It did it did that happens <laughs> that happens when I haven't like opened the hold on let's let's fix Alex's. Oh no, Alex is fine. Let's see, that was mine. Mine's good. There we go. There Let's we go. It. That's the thing we're supposed to do beforehand. If the internet actually works for the hour before the show, <laughs> and we're not trying to cram it here before we get going. Uh, but also, you did hear that voice. He is a graphic designer out in California. I don't even know what part of California you're at these days. But Alex Cars is joining us from parts unknown California <laughs> right now. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing good. I'm I'm coming here from uh, Long Beach, California, one Long of the Beach. other cities vying for the Amazon headquarters. Oh, we're going to have to duke uh, it out a little later over that. Also, also, I have a reminder. I put this in my own personal notes to remind you that iTunes is now Apple Podcast. Wait, what? iTunes is Apple Podcast now and has been for a bit. Oh, okay. So you, you wait. So you, <laughs> wait a minute. Wait a minute. So you can't actually get podcasts in iTunes now? No, yeah, of course you can. Right? No, it's it's its own separate thing now. Right. They rebranded Wait. iTunes. They rebranded all the podcast stuff as Apple Podcasts. Oh, jeez. Yeah, in fact, they they came up with new icons. <laughs> like your like you know that how a lot of the different like Google does it. They give you your own little graphic to mm-hmm. to put on your website for downloads. Yeah, it's all rebranded. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I I could have told you about this before the show, but I thought it would be more fun to let you know now. <laughs> Let me know what I don't know during the show in front of all these tens and tens of people live on the internet. <laughs> hey, but we're spanning Thanks. multiple times out tonight. We are. We are. But anyways, this is the awesome cast where we correct each other publicly about what we don't know about technology on the internet. Uh, you can check us out at awesomecast. awesomecast.com or, and you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Thank Spreaker. You. Man, that's going to kill my flow. Jeez. <laughs> iTunes, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, and the video versions on the uh, uh, YouTube and Facebook page. You can drop us a line on the YouTube page. I'm sorry, on the what on the Twitter page uh, <laughs> at AwesomeCast. Yeah, you can comment on YouTube too. That's a thing that works t- these days, I think. Um, and you can also uh, join us live, like I said, Tuesday nights uh, at 7 p.m. Eastern on our Facebook page, where we got a short link over at live.awesomecast. Dot net. Also, thanks to our streaming partners, RiversEdgePGH.com, our good friends over here in the Millvale neighborhood on the other side of the city. Um, and uh, actually, my neighborhood, it's actually a town. It's actually not a part of Pittsburgh, uh, but still. And also our friends, The405Media.com, who are out in Alex's neck of the woods, um, of course. And uh, we're streaming regularly there uh, Saturdays, 9 a.m. on River's Edge and daily at 9 a.m. Pacific time. That's a time that actually counts for Alex and noon for the rest of you over here on the East Coast. Uh, also, thanks to our Patreon supporters. You guys literally help keep the lights on around here. 
Um, yes, I just paid the bill, so literally keeping the lights on around here uh, <laughs> at Sorgatron Media Studios. And uh, with thanks to our friends that are doing that, uh, you know, at the dollar level, fan of the show, you get the recognition here on the show. Michael Fedor has been supporting us for a long time. Mike Fedor Show on the Twitter. And at the five dollar level, you guys get the uh, gold content where we get into a little bit extra stuff around the show. Uh, maybe we get a little just super techie, or we talk about the parking situation in Dormont and the weird things with the Mount Lebanon cops and everything that Chilla has going on. Uh, and you can That's that's something special you get for your $5 a month here uh, every week here at the coffee club level. And thank you, Matt Weller, uh, Matt one T underscore Weller on the Twitter. If you want to hit him up and he's also really great. I got to give him a shout out um, because uh, uh, from time to time, I, he'll, he'll drop a comment on the Facebook f- for uh, page where we post the, the, the final video afterwards. And, and um, and and it'll just be a giant paragraph of what he thought about a topic that hits his that that, that hits him. Uh, that'll show up a day or two after we put the show up. And I, I just I really appreciate those deep dives that he go he does. And uh, and 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 so definitely keep an eye out for those. Follow those posts to see what comes up. And of course, we have other levels. Uh, the ten dollar level, uh, you guys get the state of the show. Uh, let you know what's coming up. Some behind the scenes things that we don't a lot of times publicly talk about. That's coming up with the show and changes and upgrades that we're working on. Um, and there's also a $20 executive producer level you can join us at. Uh, anybody that joins us at, at this level for four months uh, will even send you your very own executive producer business cards. You'll be labeled as an executive producer in our show notes on the show in a video version. Uh, shout outs, of course, in this section as well. Please support the show at patreon.com slash awesome cast. So let's get into our awesome things of the week. It's time to deep dive a couple of things over here. Uh, let's start with the gaming and Chilla. So, yeah. So I actually finally got to play around with uh, a Nintendo Switch. Um, there it is. I'm totally super happy with it. Um, I'm amazed at the boot up time, the battery life. Um, I'm... I'm definitely deeply involved in playing some some zelda um really liking the form factor i'm amazed i wish i was in the studio so i could hand this over to you so you could and maybe you've i think held taught chachis i'm not sure the weight on it's really nice um the other thing that chachi doesn't while have I'm, one chachi doesn't have that? one chachi doesn't oh, have he one. doesn't no he's still on the wii u that's why he's playing zelda on uh, but i have played with my brothers Okay, so I'm super happy with the weight. Um, the one thing that I wasn't crazy about when when I originally looked at it was the game library. Um, I'm really excited for uh, Metroid. Um, I'm going to spend most of my time in Zelda and Mario Kart for now. Um, but overall, the device is nice. The feels nice. I, it's the 720p resolution isn't that bad because of the screen size. Um, I'll be honest with you, I haven't even docked it to play with it yet. The other thing that really caught my eye about it was I actually used to use a Nintendo Wii controller um, and a lot of emulators on a, on an Android device. Mm-hmm. Um, and they asked, someone actually came up with a Joy-Con dock for the, for the joysticks um, where you can take the Joy-Con... You can take the sticks off, so they come off pretty easily here. So these these come off, and they're kind of like your 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 Wii motes. Um, someone made actually a dock, and I haven't picked up the dock yet. That you dock these into, and it lets you use them with an Android device. So I can actually run the same emulators with these instead of a Wii mote, and I'll get. Uh, a little more feature functionality so i can still play my old nintendo games i'm hoping that nintendo does some stuff with with emulators and whatnot i know they're they've obviously have an emulator on their new super nintendo uh mini that they kind of came out with um and the old the last year last uh fall they came out with the old 16-bit nintendo i'm, I'm hoping for that kind of stuff to come to the to the switch itself but so far it's I'm amazed that it boots up in about 10 to 15 seconds, which is faster than my Xbox, faster than most of your bigger consoles. Um, And it gives me that console type gameplay on the go. Um, 
I have been playing more and more while sitting on my couch and I don't want to tie up the TV to play games. Um, but I, I want to have kind of that, that family room type atmosphere. If Christopher's doing whatever, Carla's doing whatever, or someone else wants to watch the TV, I can kind of still, still be in the room, still participate, but kind of playing my game while other others are watching the TV or doing whatnot. So I, I'm totally sold on the, on the concept. Um, I've also, read some posts about you know it, it's not out of the the cards for the new star wars battlefront 2 to come to the device and some other some other lead lead style games so i'm i'm hoping i'm hoping for the expansion of that library it's definitely a, a pretty capable system for whatever everything i'm seeing about it i i really is just time and bandwidth i i like say i have an xbox one that i barely touched since i picked one up um but it's nice to watch blu-rays at home uh but uh you know it, it's i think you are going to start seeing a bottleneck sooner or later with the switch especially as we're getting our xboxes and ps uh fours are, are kind of uh, um unleashing higher end 4k versions right like i don't think the switch is hitting that but, uh, but, yeah. but but I think you're still you're, it, it's a very very capable. It doesn't feel as far behind the curve as say when the Wii U came out, um, or even when the Wii came out. So um, I, I think it's it's really good, and and maybe it doesn't need to push as much power because of the type of device it is. If you want, you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and even looking at from a lot of the things I'm seeing out of Microsoft, um, the the Xbox One X that's going to be their 4K and even the One S that has some 4K capability, those games are all going to be backwards compatible. So obviously they're doing things to to be able to render on the older devices, on the, the old 1080p. And I know, I mean, there's people I know that even have the the newer Xbox hook, hooked up to a, a large 720p screen. Obviously it doesn't have, mm -hmm. it's not pushing the 4k pieces. It's not pushing even 1080p. So I'm hoping they can downscale a lot of that shrink, potentially shrink the file size even, and then allow it to render on some of the older devices. Oh, you know, and it seems to be doing pretty well too. It seems that, um, uh, last I've seen, uh, there was an article that it may be outselling the other consoles at this point. Um, what, so it, that's pretty cool. And, and the thing I'm excited about it is not just having some couch play without having to tie up the TV. It's that it's small and light enough I can throw it in a bag and take it pretty mm -hmm. much anywhere. It really does lend to your, your super portable world at this point, doesn't it? Yeah. So that's good to see. Um, Alex, I think we're going to both jam on this next one. Uh, there was a lot coming out of Adobe Max this week, and you, of course, an avid, um, avid graphic designer is paying a lot of attention to that, I believe, right? Yep, uh, I was telling, I was talking to Missy about this and kind of getting ready for the this week. There's a, there's definitely a lot to unpack uh, coming out of out of the big announcements. Uh, I'll rattle off a couple of these, but I want to focus on two in particular mm -hmm. for my awesome thing: uh, experience design, which was a thing for that Adobe was doing to make it easier for people to, you know, uh, go from prototype to. Uh, from design to prototype to actual like previewing on devices, uh, that is now out of beta and it is now Adobe XD CC. Project Felix is dead, aka out of beta. Now it's Dimension CC. Uh, and then there's some other ones, but well, what, what was what was uh, Project Felix? Uh, Project Felix. Oh, sorry. Uh, Project Felix allowed you to uh, composite uh, do compositing between 2D and 3D modeling, like. I believe uh, you could either put uh, images onto 3D objects or uh, incorporate 3D objects into like photographs, 2D design, basically. Like basically, uh, a good example that one person said in a testimonial was that they were able to do uh, screenshots for like uh, a virtual, like a, an augmented reality app, uh, and they were able to do that using Project Felix. So now it's out of beta and it's become Dimension CC and there's a lot of extra features with it now. Wow, we're looking at it here on the video and that looks really cool and looks like something that we can maybe use in some of our design work too. So mm -hmm. that, that, that's really nice. Yeah, it, it's like kind of wrapping around 3D objects and everything. So it's kind yeah. of a kind of a layering system, I guess. Does that seem right? Mm -hmm. 
I think right. so. That's what it seems to be. I, I haven't had a chance to play with it too much yet. But and can, and can you explain a little bit what um, the Adobe XD, the the former, uh, I forget what it was called before. Uh, it's, it's bas- it used to be uh, Adobe Experience Design, basically. And it's for those that are uh, working with user experience, like in that field, um, it's supposed to help. Like the way I've seen this, like it's an easy way for graphic designers to get into user experience design and like. So like apps, uh, websites, things like right. that. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so and the, and these are kind of creating are they are they creating functional um, um, things or just kind of uh, templating things and maybe slicing it up so I can apply it to an app or a website? Well, I think from what I understand, it's supposed to be from what I've seen, it looks like it's going to be easier to get like you know you do like your wireframes, then you come up with the prototype of like the actual design, mm-hmm. and then you're supposed to be able to preview like an active type preview in like wow different apps like or basically wow. on your device you know like like on an iPhone or on an iPad or I, whatever I just saw the spot, the part where it actually kind of pulls you over to like this button goes to this and this so it, it actually is uh-huh. a clickable prototype at that point mm-hmm. wow yeah. that's awesome it, it's yeah it's, it's it's a lot of fun and it's got me more interested in actually trying to do user experience design Things I'm going to things I'm downloading on my laptop to play with, <laughs> like, and it's been a while since because usually it's something that's like a little too heady and like more, mm-hmm. um, you know, code based, you know, especially like some yeah. HTML5 stuff. But man, this is actually something like I could imagine maybe putting together a user interface. Like if I need to do something, um, you know, I've, I've had some people come to me and say, I want to do a podcast app, for instance, right? Like mm-hmm. I could design the what I want of the podcast app with what I know of design. And yeah. hand that to a developer, right? Yeah, it'd be great. It'd be great for that Sorgatron Media app we we talked about mm-hmm. years ago. That's completely oh, <laughs> oh they're, they're they're still talking in the background that we don't talk about that. If you subscribe to the state of the show level at the ten dollar awesome cast Patreon, we might talk about that on there with you. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the interesting place I think that that fills in too is there's a I think there's still a large gap in the user experience when you when you think of your your big stores, and I'm just going to pick on Verizon or or potentially even AT and T, your 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 carrier based stores, and I'm sure this extends into your WalMarts and your your other types of stores. But pretty much anyone that's going to have a walk up kiosk, um, when you think about how their website versus potentially their app that they have in the store or and or the app that they give to their consumer on their their phone or tablet they typically have a disjunct user experience and it's it's one experience on their website it's one experience in their app and then it's one experience in their in-store private app this seems like it'll easily bridge that gap and allow them to take the same interfaces the same content the same look and feel and really bring it across the number of devices. And when you think about screen resolution in Android or or even even in the Apple ecosystem today, with, with the with the different size and device and the different resolution, I, I think this helps kind of bridge what the user is looking for and makes their life easier when they jump through the experiences of dealing with any kind of major retailer. Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm looking at this too, and, and I think I saw that these these you know can be included starting at 9.99 uh, from the pages that I had pop up. Like you get in here, you can start a new design. And say, hey, I want to develop something for an iPad, right, or a web, or something like that, and it's already templated right. everything out for you. So like it, it's a nice starting point. And you can start designing from that. Um, and, and I think this is probably Alex. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. If you're familiar with something like Illustrator, this is going to pretty much be plug and play for you, right? Yeah, in fact, actually, it's funny you mention that. There, uh, Illustrator recently had a plugin released specifically for Illustrator that actually kind of touched on, um, sorry, kind of going back to the dimension stuff, like the three D design. Mm-hmm. So there's actually a plugin for Illustrator now that allows you to uh, kind of incorporate your designs that you, your vector, the vector based stuff that you do in Illustrator onto. Uh, Onto 3D like 3D like stock photos or type thing, and so, and I gotta yeah, I gotta yeah. point out right off the bat, this is gonna be full screen on your Mac. <laughs> if you're frustrated <laughs> like I am about your Photoshop situation, they still haven't updated that, yeah. right? I don't think they have. 
but I'm not sure. I haven't. They, they did because all I knew was that I had like 19 app updates, and they were all updating to the latest version, and all the latest versions of apps had some of the big features, and that that's what got me looking into it more. Was mm. oh okay, it's, it has that. So uh, another thing, and this might be interesting for you, Sorg. Uh, on the video side, After Effects will let you make effects and transitions for 360 and virtual reality. What? So uh, I don't have too much info on that. Just that that's a, a possibility. Well, so. I think that's because they're they're talking about some experimental AI stuff uh, as well. And uh, that's actually my awesome thing of the week because I was digging into this, and this was all sneak peek stuff. So this is all kind of their beta, kind of, you know, again, it's in a prototype phase, but this is the things that could definitely be bringing over to things like maybe Premiere and Photoshop, right? Uh, there were two points to it, and I was, I was checking it out on an article on The Verge over here. Um, so we're looking at, uh, there, there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, let, let's look at uh, Scene Stitch, right? So they're taking photos, and you can, you can cut out like a section of the image, right? Um, that you only... Let me go full screen here and hope Adobe doesn't do a takedown. So you can select like a section, like, you know, hey, you know, maybe under this river needs to go away. And then it'll actually search through Adobe stock photos and replace that section with what it thinks may, let me see where they're showing the sections, what it thinks may fit, right? And not everything works, right, as they go through. It may be just other scenery. It may be just, um, they're showing some uh, skylines in Denver, and uh, they took out the kind of bottom neighborhood that's that's uh, be, you know beneath the trees, and you can kind of see it and everything like that. Uh, and then you could replace it. Take, like one of them was like beachfront property, um, just other roads that are just kind of running into the trees. Like it is, it, and there's several that work very very well with with limited modification. They look like they could work. Um, and then there's other ones that just looks like these trees are coming out over other skyscrapers, right? Again, they say not perfect, but it can give you like a little bit, you know, some different inspirations um, coming around this stuff. And I, I thought that was really cool. Again, very AI generated and, and kind of another take on what we see with a lot of our AI machine learning things that are happening these days with uh, Google Photos that we've been talking about a lot on the show. And I think this maybe lends to a little bit with the 3D, uh, I'm sorry, 360 editing and things like that. Um, but they they have um, Project Cloak. So, you know, in, in the example that they have, there's a, there's a nice shot here of, uh, you know, kind of coming up on a bridge and, and I forget, this is, I don't know, the Taj Mahal or something like that. Uh, you know, a nice, nice, nice building here, but there's a big light post in the way as you're, as you're floating by. So now with this system, and there's actually different way, different methods they kind of tried here. One makes it look like kind of that cloaking effect, honestly, because it's taking kind of pixels before and after, right? Um, but as you get in there, there's a version of this where it absolutely takes out the post and, uh, and, and is really good about kind of seeing what those in-betweens are. There's another scene in here where they added, they took away part of a strap, uh, a weird cross strap on a, on a guy's backpack as he's walking through. And then as they go go through again, they actually take the couple out of this scene through this canyon where they're walking. And it's just a pan shot of the background. Really, really cool stuff that I know, uh, and Alex, you, you can probably uh, 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 vouch for this on on at least the, uh, the, the scene stuff. Really, really hard. Like I've done following scenes for blurring content, like logos and things in that frame by frame monotony. And if this gives you that head start on something like this and seems to do it clean and actually does to this effect, and, and, and to be clear, much with a lot of these effects, the better the footage, the better this is going to turn out, right? Um, these guys are probably, I'm, I'm guessing this is like 4K footage that they're, they're addressing here. So there's a lot of information for it to deal with, right? Um, I also wasn't clear if the AI was um, server-based or like in in house so like local to your machine yeah is it local or is it is it bumping up to like the big adobe server in the cloud and to looking at things like that um i did not catch in the article which was the case and i didn't go deep into it. i watched the two videos on here uh to see the processes but uh either way um if they if this is what they're doing these days it, it's got to be machine it's got to be cloud machine uh ai yeah, i'm time. guessing i'm guessing it would be cloud but it'd be interesting to see how it how much data it chooses through to push the that all that video up and 
up and then back to then try to figure out the, mm-hmm. the different pieces of information. So who knows? Yeah, especially with the video files, right? But it could be just taken um, if 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 the software is good about analyzing the picture or the footage locally, it, it, and it's only sending basically algorithms and math up, that might be okay. Mm-hmm. That might be doable on on a typical internet connection. So, but you'll never edit on the on the on the plane ever again. Well, unless the plane has high speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which how many do these days, right? Um, yeah. No, no, absolutely. And there's some more Adobe stuff I want to touch on here, um, of course. Uh, but at least, at least well, I, you know, real quick, Adobe is gonna, uh, it has remade Lightroom uh, CC as a hybrid app, and it's going to have one terabyte of cloud storage. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and also kind of a competitor to Photos. Uh, are you a Lightroom user uh, yourself, Alex? I'm not, but I've given some thought to it, and I thought it was interesting. They also, because also on there, they make mention of the fact that if you are still using like regular Lightroom, it's become Lightroom Classic. Mm-hmm. But so, yeah, Lightroom, so, so, so it's still available. Like, you can still do mm-hmm. this. Uh, I mean, you you can still just do the way you you always have. If you're like, oh, I don't know about putting it in the cloud, you know what happens, and you know all all the the question marks you would have around something like that, right? Right. Exactly. So yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, like I think the the big things like being what are being able to uh, work on wherever you're working on, regardless of what platform and where you're at. Mm-hmm. Like that that idea is just like really awesome to me. Um, the so I, I the two that I want to really focus on. Uh, one of these is Adobe Audition, mm-hmm. which I meant I told I told you before. Like as I made my kind of return doing my own podcasting. I transitioned from using GarageBand to using Adobe Audition. And one thing I discovered I had to do was I had to manually like lower the volume of the uh like any background music I had like had to do all that stuff manually. And there's a, a process called auto decking, which I used to have in GarageBand. Mm-hmm. And that was one thing I missed from having GarageBand. But apparently, Adobe Edition now has auto ducking. Nice. So they 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 finally they finally brought that uh, feature you're looking for, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I've gotten so used to doing it manually that it's not even a, an issue now. But I mean, I might use that to make it just a little bit easier for future projects. And, and definitely, but, highly yeah. recommended if you're a podcaster out there um, to. You know, uh, GarageBand is great, but at a certain point, you know, you're going to need things mm-hmm. like, ooh, we need to adjust this volume a little bit or, or you know, things like that. Uh, definitely, definitely Audition, I think, is the go-to. And, and pretty affordable at $20 a month. And you know at $20 a month, you're also getting probably a bunch of other um, um, apps as well along with that, right? Maybe some right. of them that we, 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 we've we been talking about. Um, and, and also, and remember, everything that we've talked about is available. Uh, for for instance, for us, for the work we do here, and, and it's kind of like, ah, we use uh, Encore for DVDs. We use Photoshop for, for images here and there, right? Um, and, and just a smattering of things, of little things. But now, you know, all that is $50 a month. Everything that you've talked about, Alex, is included in that $50 a month uh, yep. uh, plan. And, and so now you can go tinker with these and maybe you have a new tool that does a new thing for your business. Um, or you can become proficient in prototyping something like that. If you're thinking about apps, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and kind of slide into something like that, which makes it way, way more accessible than when I was coming up through school. And each one of these options was $200. Four hundred dollars, six hundred dollars for each time they upgrade. Now it's just included, and that's one of the kind of beautiful things about what they're doing the cloud. Well, good, good on it, Adobe. I'm, I'm, I'm going to add some some commentary to that one, Sorg. Mm-hmm. And I know Alex, you and I talked about this a little bit in the Slack channel too. Uh, I like their like the Spark Post and stuff like that. The apps for mm-hmm. my phone. And Alex, you were, you were telling me about some of the branding stuff that they're actually doing with some of that content, so you can kind of self brand. Your yeah. own stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. One of the premium features for Adobe, like, it's interesting, like, you know, there's a lot of stuff you can do for free, basically, but there's certain things that you could pay premium. And that's like either $9.99 a month or it's included with the creative cl- cloud plans. So, but one of the new uh, premium features is you can add branding elements. And it's, and it's not just your logo either. We're talking, you add a logo, uh, you pick the colors that match your brand. It'll even automatically detect the color, like the color from your logo. 
like if you have like a one or two logo, uh, like a one or two logo, or sorry, one or two color logo, it'll automatically detect the color from that logo. And it'll add it to like the colors that you want to use for your, uh, the branding stuff. Which it'll I, help you find your type, like your, your fonts as well. Which I think is the, the greatest thing to it because I'm not someone who, you know, kind of anything that I've learned with Adobe Suite, I've either learned from watching Sorg or watching hours and hours and hours of YouTube videos. So I've never really had any formal training with it. Also, remember, Adobe has their own training videos, too. Exactly. And the cool thing about it is, is that if I want to go in and do something quickly, the Adobe Spoke po- or Spark post was the easiest way to do it mm-hmm. um, because I didn't have to pull up the full version of Photoshop on my PC, which kind of bogs things down. I can do it literally in the palm of my hand on the fly, and then it would save it all right there. Um, so the fact that I can actually go through and the, the hardest part that I had with that was the color selection. And if they kind of have it intuitive to kind of, hey, I think this is the color palette you're looking for for this based on your image. I think it's the coolest mm-hmm. thing ever. Yeah, I, I gave that a little test with like my own logo and I actually, it, it, it picked up the color like easily, no problem. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, the only the only slight bummer was like, um, and that, this is because I don't, because there's only, there's certain fonts that are available. Mm-hmm on there and it's not like something that you can even pull out of like type kit or whatever which would which i think would be a nice improvement like an addition in the future but then again like the the, the type of the font that i use for my logo isn't even in type kit that's a separate thing entirely <laughs> well but i think that it can kind of give you something close to it at least um, exactly yeah so yeah. If, if you're in the right ballpark it looks better than trying to do something right comic sans with uh ariel well that was the biggest thing with me was was I couldn't really, I don't have the mindset and I'm not good enough of a designer to design from scratch, but with a little bit of hand holding, I can make something cool. Right. And that's where something like spark and all these other things like this branding thing actually is really interesting to me. Um, because I think, you know, we have enough know how and, and, you know, design capability to, to kind of develop things, you know, with that little bit of extra, Hey, this will match over here, you know? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I, I think, and then we just, you know, defer to Alex to check our work and uh, <laughs> out there on our West Coast connection. Uh, yeah. So, you know, things like that. So, you know, sort of all of this talk about the Adobe stuff is making me pretty hungry. You know, it's making me hungry for getting that this Mac over here is in a touchscreen and just poking it. Um, <laughs> jeez. Jeez. Where, wait, where did they, they put the, the post? I, I, went, I went on the incline. I can't find their... Uh, uh, go to the link that's in the doc. That would make sense. This is. Anyways, thank you very much to our friends uh, Slice on Broadway supporting Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza right here. The original, the OG is right here up the streets on uh, on Broadway. Hence the name, uh, right here in the Beachview neighborhood, as well as their other locations, Main Street down in Carnegie, PA, PNC Park, home of the Pittsburgh Pirates, and their brand new location, if Dave Potter doesn't uh, kick down the door first, it's East Liberty, all the way out there, East End, whatever the kids want to call it these, these days. And of course, shout outs to the ultimate pizza showdown over at the incline.com make sure you get your votes in as well uh and uh they they are down to the final four uh here and of course uh, uh slice on broadway taking on the devastating vincent's pizza park of green tree uh so we'll see how that shakes out but also i want to notice um this is a this is a very uh south hills oriented pizza showdown here uh uh, as well so it goes to show that we have some of the best pizza stuff in the neighborhood going down here and 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 the best the multiple time winner of best pizza in whatever publication we're going with uh this week has been slice on broadway and uh thank you so much to those guys for supporting the shows for so long here on the sorgatron media network check them out slice on broadway.com pgh underscore slice on twitter and let them know that awesome cast sent you. So let's get into. Listen, Alex. Apparently, we got to throw down here because apparently <laughs> we are in a bitter contest of bitterest contest that does not involve the Philadelphia Flyers. Uh, it is. 
<laughs> it is it is the 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 contest to to determine who is going to get the HQ2 from Amazon. It is going down, sir, and <laughs> apparently it's getting heated. Now, I, I I haven't even completely watched to be honest. <laughs> A video that everybody's going gaga about. I know the girls were talking about it on Bold Pittsburgh this week. I'm sorry, Bold Mornings on Bold Pittsburgh this week. Uh, and so, so apparently we put, we put together a pretty kick-ass uh, video montage, um, and then Anthony Bourdain, Bourdain uh, told everybody to be sad for Pittsburgh. So there was that too. But anyways, <laughs> what's going on in the what's going on in the uh, 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 Long Beach area for you guys trying to uh, acquire some uh, Amazon headquarters over there? Right. Well, it's funny enough. I, I saw the I saw the video that uh, they put on for Long Beach mm-hmm. uh, for their bid. Is it and all actually, muscles and swimming? No, no. But what's really interesting about it is that it's actually two cities have teamed up. So it's actually Long Beach and Huntington Beach have teamed up for the bid for the headquarters. Now, what the, the way this is working is that it's kind of a dual proposal. And I, I got some snippets from uh, a local article about it. So in the dual proposal, the two beach cities are proposing a partnership that would split a potential HQ2 into three sites, two in Long Beach and one in Huntington Beach. The 164-acre Huntington Sand Campus location would be located at the uh, existing Boeing facility, uh, while the Long Beach locations would be split between the Sea Campus at One World Trade Center and the Air Campus at the Boeing uh, C-17 site near Long Beach Airport. So basically, they're kind of teaming up. Like the idea was like because of the kind of uh, requirements that Amazon put on for what they were looking for. Uh, and so the hope is that Long Beach and Huntington Beach combined will uh, reach those particular requirements. So, for example, there was a quote from our mayor, uh, Mayor Garcia, who said uh, the Long Beach has a vibrant t- downtown on the water, a metro rail connection downtown Long. Uh, downtown Los Angeles, an airport, one of the world's busiest and greenest ports, a great public school system, and the best people and workforce anywhere. And while we, and while Long Beach lacks an international airport, we have both John Wayne Airport and the LAX Airport that would provide flights out of the country for the operations. So I thought it was really interesting, not only that Long Beach has put in their bid, but like they've, they've teamed up with Huntington Beach for this. Interesting. That just tells me that they don't have the confidence that they could make it themselves like yeah, Pittsburgh does. Yeah, they don't have the schools. Hey. They don't have the, the sports <laughs> yeah, teams, the that. tech that's, infrastructure. I think that's grounds for disqualification. <laughs> 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 what is this? What is this? Outsourcing. You, you, you can't get two cities to team up. It was one city. <laughs> hey, I don't, I don't make the rules, man. <laughs> I don't make, you don't make the calls. You just vote for the guys that do, right? But anyways, sure. um, no, no, and I, and I love the spirited thing that's happening. It, it, it kind of takes me back to when Google Fiber was a hotly contested thing among cities. Um, I was at Tulsa, Oklahoma, to call themselves Google for the, for for a time, Google Oklahoma. Um, but uh, but still, you know, no, no, this is great, and, and and I'm hoping. And again, there are other, you know, I'm not trying to overlook the other issues with something like Amazon, there's been a lot of discussion of like, would this really help a, a town like, like Pittsburgh or even you guys right. too? I mean, I'm sure there's other um, society problems that, that a big company and all this influx of talent and people uh, would not be beneficial for. Right. Uh, and, and we kind of see that here and dealing with those issues here in Pittsburgh. Um, but, yeah. uh, but either way, I think, you know, I feel, I feel like something like this overall that, that can boom a neighborhood um, can boom a city that maybe already might already be on the, on the rise or, or, you know, I don't know where Long Beach and Huntington is. Um, I see Boeing is a, is somebody that's around. So there's already a little bit of, you know, this kind of thing going on around there. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, that was the thing, like both cities are basically right on the water, which is kind of their thing. So it was just one of those deals where like, yeah. So yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. And I was reading more about that too, about like the issues that kind of would arise with Amazon having their headquarters, but it's definitely interesting. It's, it kind of reminds me a little bit about the whole, like every so often when we get ready, when we get closer to Olympic season, it always gets fun to, to see that stuff happening. <laughs> yeah, that too. That too. But man, don't get me started on the Olympics. <laughs> feels like a waste. Yeah. Wait, your guys are getting the Olympics soon, aren't you? 
Like in yeah, LA. LA is getting one in 2024, I believe. Wow. Tw- either 20, it's either that or 2028. I don't remember which. Are they just, but are they just renovating the Coliseum or? That's one of the venues they're using. Yes. Oh, good. But good. I think they are building, they're building at least one new uh, venue. And I believe it's where the LA sports arena used to be. Okay. And then there's some stuff in Long Beach, which I'm personally excited about. Maybe it'll, uh, help, maybe it'll help with a little bit of that road infrastructure. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I was I was actually just ta- I was talking to a driver uh, that I was talking to earlier today about the traffic circle in Long Beach. There's one like right off of like PCH basically, and it's it was built in like the 30s, like around the time that they had the last Summer Olympics in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. They built that to help with traffic congestion for the events that were in Long Beach then. So maybe you'll get something else inventive. Maybe just a bigger traffic circle around downtown. Maybe every intersection. Hey, can will we be get traffic circle. or can we just have um um everything going in the same direction, not be under construction, and get me lost downtown next time we decide to have lunch out there? Because that was fun. <laughs> Jeez, that is, this is why I did lift the entire time I was out there the first time. Um, we'll see what Van Nuys is like in April. So. Anyways, uh, let's touch base on a couple of these. There was, yes, yes, yes. I know that we're wrapping up the show, Mm -hmm. but I'm going to have to say that you and Riz both shared a story, and I think that it should, it deserves some uh, conversation. Is it the giant robot battle? It is the giant robot battle. That turned out like like the the highly touted boxing match that didn't uh, turn out. Yeah. Uh, It it turned out like CM Punk's first MMA fight that... uh, (laughs) I I think that's a discussion for a different show, sir. So there is, there is, but, um, uh, and, and by the way, so the robot fight happened. And it was short, and I don't know if it was sweet, but I think I think people will will be reconsidering their center of balance in future iterations <laughs> of of robot fighting because it started. Um, they sprayed something at the other one, and then it just pushed it over, <laughs> pushed That's it beautiful. over. It was pretty, and yet still. There was a 26-minute <laughs> Twitch presentation, a pre-taped Twitch presentation that oh, was put man. out there. And and our original co-host of this show, Rob De La Creta, was furious uh, at this. And not just for the design and everything like that, but mostly at the very inept and insulting to its audience um, presentation by Twitch. Um, in this case, that this is a whole 20 second fight, which is what it took for um, Team uh, Team USA to get across the, the venue to push it over. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that was it. And, and that was at the, by the way, if you find the giant robot duel on Megabots Inc., um, it's at about the mm, nine minute mark. You know, give yourself a little runway on that. But either way, safety first. By the way, I you know, I am looking forward to the day. As some know, I work with a, a certain group that does um, 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 uh, SAE International that does a, a collegiate design for formula cars and Baja and, and other other really cool things that have motors. Um, and I cannot wait for the college design series for giant fighting robots to come soon uh, because <laughs> that's where this is going, folks. I really think so. And I might pitch it when I go in for a podcast tomorrow to the office. Uh, so just putting that out there. Um, but anyways, no, it, this is the, <laughs> cool that it happened. Maybe not a great result. This is what we have. So, oh, man. Uh, sorry, I got it. So this whole thing about the robot fight reminded me of uh, UFC on Fox, the very first special they did. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the rare times I actually watched anything UFC related. And they had like an hour, and I, I think it was supposed to be live because the hour uh, presentation they had was of the main event uh, with the assumption of like however many rounds, three or five minute rounds or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I can't even remember who. I remember one of the guys that was fighting in the main event was a guy that had like his issues with Brock Lesnar when he was still in UFC. And so they had this whole hour long presentation they talked a little bit about the undercard, which was streamed on the Facebook Live. 
something or whatever. And, uh, or yeah, on, they were it was live streamed on Facebook and then they had this whole thing for their main event and the main event lasted less than one minute into the first round. And then they had to spend like however long explaining, like doing all sorts of analysis to basically cover the fact you gotta make that it, up it was for it. So 45 had, seconds. So they had no preliminary fights to throw in there or anything like that? Not on the thing, because they did it all on, on a separate thing. And this is why I watch pro wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> right. It, one of the things that I don't understand was it, in watching that clip and, and all of the few seconds it took for the one robot to walk over and push the other one and win was then why did this have to be filmed over multiple days with multiple repairs taking place in between mm-hmm. like could the robot could the robots not even get a couple feet before they broke down and then had to be repaired like what it's it, to me it's confusing how this actually worked out I think it would have been more entertaining to do like a behind the scenes thing for the rest of their time. Be like, this is what happened leading up to this. Yeah. Time. yeah it was all kind of interviews and it was all kind of uh, host um, vamping. So what you're saying is it reason. was a bunch of hype. It, it was a bunch of hype. They got, they got a lot of hype. Uh, but anyways, uh, other than that, uh, hey, you know, I thought this was cool that, you know, technology actually helping a really, you know, serious situation out there. Uh, Project Loon's LTE balloons are indeed floating over Puerto Rico now. Uh, so that is, again, you know, while not something that I think Google was, was kind of moving forward with a lot, um, this was a really cool practical um, um, reason for them to do it. It is out from Alphabet's X and, uh, Innovation Lab again. Uh, Alphabet is is now basically the parent company of Google, uh, but uh, yeah, they're 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 helping to try to provide to, uh, to provide uh, wireless connections there. Um, they partnered with AT and T to uh, lighten up the limited internet connection uh, with support for uh, text messaging and basic web access and email, so people can at least do that. Um, so it's really cool to see again one of these kind of experimental, forward thinking things um, kind of being applied in a very serious situation. Uh, so um, they say whether you're connected to Loon, and this is a core gadget, or regular tower, LTE will display on the phone still the same way. So really, instead of just Wi-Fi, which I think is what it was uh, basically initially uh, designed for, they're actually kind of relaying the LTE uh, signals to probably dead spots to do the, the um, you know, lack of power to the towers and everything like that. Uh, so, you know, again, really cool that it, it, it looks like it's going to be seamless uh, for people using it down there. Uh, so, uh, you know, again, just good to see some some good uh, forward-thinking technology used in a really good situation. The, the one thing that I thought was interesting about this and I was reading, I think um, Apple had to push behind the scenes behind the scenes firmware updates to the Apple devices in that area to connect on a different LTE band. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think it, I, I thought it was interesting to see the number of tech conglomerates that may not always get along kind of come together definitely for the greater good. So I was definitely happy to see, you know, your Googles, your Apples, your AT&Ts, everybody coming, coming in and, and, and really, collaborating to to solve a difficult technology problem mm-hmm. and also and finally chilla um i i know i screwed up i was, I was going to get cross this week and talk about the new phone but you have something that to, to consider i think uh when it comes to what phone you pick up these days yeah, and it was an interesting conversation we had because because Krauss and, and I'm sure he'll come on and he'll give a much more deep dive into the the, the Pixel. He got the two XL, um, which is the larger phone. It's been getting a lot of um, press and not all that good press across the the internets um, as it. It's not using a Samsung OLED display. I think it's using a display made by LG. Um, And there's a lot of people complaining about the way Google's handling um, screen dimming. So if it's not at 100% brightness, it's not all that great. And even at 100% brightness, um, the panel just isn't getting the image quality. Um, Now, I'm... I'm probably not the perfect use case because I'm pretty anal retentive when it comes to image quality. Mm-hmm. Um, for instance, I will actually hook up the good old antenna um, 
and and watch my a football game over antenna because I can't handle the that MPEG uh, distorting uh, on the grassy fields of of the NFL during uh, football games. But what we did was we we took the we took a Samsung Galaxy Note eight, the Google Pixel two XL, the iPhone seven, and the iPhone eight. Um, sent the exact same picture to all of them, so they they it's it's all the exact same JPEG, um, and then put them up on the screen and sat the screens uh, side by side um, to see. I, I wanted to see what is the is it as big of a deal as people are making it on the internet, and and my personal opinion is yes. Um, so obviously here, I mean, what you're seeing is a picture of a picture, but left to right, you have the Note 8, then you have uh, the second one in from the left is the uh, Google Pixel XL, and then you have the iPhone 7, and then the iPhone 8. And it, it's kind of hard to, to tell in this picture, because obviously we're looking at a picture of phones displaying a picture. But to me, the, the Pixel XL, if you look at the skin tones, they're very blue and quite washed out. Mm -hmm. um, I will say I personally like the Note 8 um, a lot, especially in person, but I will say the colors are definitely oversaturated. Um, and then the iPhones, to me, give the most authentic representation of the photo. Where, where I think this is interesting, and we were having this conversation today, is you know, if, if you take a picture of someone or something and send it to 20 people, looking at this end result, if all, all if all 20 people that you send it to all have a different phone, um, they could get a much different reaction to the photo being like, oh, this this photo really sucks <laughs> versus, wow, the color in this is amazing. Um, so, so it was just an interesting look at taking the same photo across multiple devices and then what the interpretation of the other user could be um, for me. The, the 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 Pixel 2 XL is a $930 phone. Um, I personally would be upset if I spent $930 on a phone and I had a rather subpar lackluster um, display. Maybe this is something Google can handle with firmware updates. Um, I'm not certain. Um, uh, displays are my my forte, but hopefully they can do something with this to make it look a little better. Um, I, I don't know what your guys' opinions are. Just looking at that that picture, what what your thoughts are? Well, I think it's also subjective. Uh, you know, again, you're somebody seeing uh, uh, them side by side. And in the day to day, if you're just like, I feel like I'm squinting at things, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think I think that's that's the big thing. You don't realize how bad your screen is or your, how great your screen is until you look at another one, right? Um, so. I, I think that's the thing. Just kind of like you don't realize how big your phone is until you hold one that you had two phones ago, like a, a, a four or a five series, right? Yeah, I guess for me, though, I would, especially when you look at the differential between the, the Note and the Pixel, I, I feel like I would send that picture to people and be like, wow, look how amazing the, and vibrant the colors are. If you sent that to someone and said, look, look at how great this looks, I, I feel like people on the other end are going to be like, I don't see what's so great about it. Right, right, exactly. So, no, oh, it'll be interesting. Um, but, yeah, I, I guess comparatively, no, yeah, it, it, that that's kind of a problem. And especially for something that is supposed to be Google's, like, the, uh, this is our flagship. Mm -hmm. that, this that is hurts. what we want everyone else to mimic, and this is what we think would is the best experience. Right. It, uh, I'm just not seeing it. So that's this unfortunate. Is this is what happens when you have a, a Google company try to be a phone company and they're like, oh, yes, our phone is awesome. Yours sucks. Is that the comparison well, that we're drawing here? But they, if they've aqua hired companies in the past. I mean, they bought Motorola, sold them off. They're buying HTC people. I, I don't know. I feel like they're a, they're a tech company that's... Talent should they be could, there. They um, should be there. Are they uh, doing the supply chain well? I guess mm -hmm. right. Uh, you know those parts, like getting the screens or whatever they need to for that. So I don't know. We'll see how that shakes out. We'll get some more. We'll try to get uh, Kraus in here in the coming weeks to get uh, some more in-depth thoughts about this as well. So Alex Cars, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Thank you for having me. 
He has all the right internets. Everything is great. He's not out stuck up in the mountains for this. This is great. We're <laughs> going to have to get you on uh, more often now. Mm-hmm. It'll so, be fun. Uh, where can people check out what do you have going on? Well, I've got a few different places, so bear with me here. I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> uh, you can find my main site at alexandercars.com. Uh, you can hit me up on Twitter at alexandercars. Uh, I recently got a new domain specifically for my portfolio. You can check that at alexcars.media. And you can follow me on Instagram at alexcarsmedia for uh, take a look at my design work and stuff like that. Uh, those, And then I've got a bunch of other projects happening. Uh, we mentioned on the Wrestling Mayhem show all the time about Occupy Pro Wrestling. Mm-hmm. Really excited about stuff going on with that podcast and everything. I recently had a chance to uh, display some of my stuff and try to sell my wares at a wrestling show, so that was cool. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, there's a lot of places, but you can start out uh, by hitting me up on Twitter at Alexander Cars. Awesome. Go check it out. Check out his stuff, especially when you need some graphic design down, uh, done. Uh, he's done a lot of great work with us here uh, for some projects around uh, around our network. Uh, so check him out. Thanks a lot. And also, John Chichilla. He's ChillaTech.net and Chilla on the Twitter. And John Chill on the Facebooks. Yes. And, uh, of course, uh, next week is our Halloween episode. We're going to be doing, I don't know, Halloween-y things. Well, it'll be interesting because there will be trick-or-treating happening right outside this window, right next to me, during the show. Uh, it's going to be fun. We're going to be doing some pumpkin carving this weekend. And so hopefully we have some cool, fun, geeky things to show off from that as well. Uh, so we're going to have some fun with that. So uh, stay tuned for details on our Facebook page and our social media in the meantime as well. And, of course, uh, hey, shouts to producer Missy keeping things together. Oh, you didn't forget me this week. No, because I have a camera for you. <laughs> yeah. That helps. It definitely helps, right? Yeah, because you're seeing my face over on your Hello. screen going, oh, wait. <laughs> there she is. Uh, a lot of things happening around the Sorgatron media world, and uh, she's helping keep things together. Uh, and check out everythingawesomecast.com. Make sure to subscribe. If you like this, please share it, especially live when we're doing this. If you like it, share it to your, your own page uh, on Facebook. Uh, that, that that interaction alone helps get it in front of more people and hopefully two nor- more viewers of this and listeners of this. So please subscribe, rate, review, um, especially on iTunes. I'm sorry, Apple Podcasts is, <laughs> is a big, really big help to us. Uh, so it's going to be iTunes forever. I'm, I'm sorry. They know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, so thank you to our awesome chat room that's been uh, in there all night long. You've been our awesome audience. Have an awesome week. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.